thank you very much. I was promised this audience would be much sexier than you are, so I'm a little disappointed. <laughs> it is Friday, though, so I'm willing to be charitable. And I do see some very sexy people here who I know quite well. There are lots of the TBWA people who I've known for some time. So it's good to see all of you here, um, including the great John Hunt, who, if there's anyone in this room who's an expert in creativity, it's that man. Uh, John, you've uh, not only single-handedly <laughs> changed the advertising business in this country, but you, with, with one look, you can change a campaign and make it a hundred times better than the initial idea. And uh, I know you work with some brilliant people, but you're the brilliant one. Give him some credit, right? Yeah. In fact, um, while we're talking, since it's creative uh, mornings before we get onto the risk issue, I, I do think it's worth mentioning that in this very building, the whole idea of unradio was actually born. And it was a TVWA team who helped us put together the idea of unradio right at the start. Um, we originally had some idea for a kind of, I think it might have been a bit lame, a political party, because it was at the time of the elections. <laughs> political parties are very lame. Um, Julius was just starting the EFF, and we were just starting Fifth Central. And there are lots of parallels between Julius and my career. <laughs> they continue to be. Not always ones that I'm pleased with, not always ones that he's pleased with. But we were both arrested for speeding within a space of two weeks of each other. I went to jail for about three hours, he didn't. I said I was guilty and paid the fine, he didn't. Uh, his party filled the stadium of uh, 40,000 people on Saturday last week. We have had uh, over seven and a half million podcast downloads and counting since we started two years ago. And the most exciting thing about what we're doing now is that it's completely uncharted territory, so I have no idea where we're going. But that brings me to risk, which is really the reason that we're here this morning. I'm in no way more qualified or less than anyone else in this room. I think anyone who takes to the road in South Africa early in the morning is uh, well versed in the concept of risk. Anybody who tries to do anything new in this country is also probably well versed, well versed in the uh, topic of risk. But I think that that's precisely why South Africans are doing the things that Elon Musk is doing in America. The kinds of things that um, this long drawn out court battle has resulted in Kwasana being able to say, please call me, which was a, a great idea. And he had to risk everything to fight this long battle to get some kind of restitution, some kind of justice in that respect. We've got some very brilliant minds in this country, and it was armed with at least that knowledge and the idea that we needed to do something new in the radio business that I decided to, at the, at the moment where I suppose some people would have thought, well, this is probably as good as it gets here on a morning show, which is the best time to be on in radio, on a big national station, you got two and a half to three million listeners, uh, that is the, the time where you really, you know, you're approaching your apex. This is not a, this is not a good time to quit if, if the traditional ideas are, are to hold any sway. That's exactly when I decided to quit. And I thought, well, if not now, when? When you're on the decline? Um, when people are getting tired of you? When, when you're not coming up with the best stuff you can come up with? Uh, now is exactly the time that you need to throw caution to the wind and do something exciting. And I knew that I was trading that two, three million listeners for a handful of listeners. But I wasn't sure how big that handful would be. Maybe it would be an armful. Maybe it would be uh, like those huge trees that everybody has to hug and make a huge circle around them. I, I wasn't sure about how many people would come with me. I just knew that this was the future. It was just something obvious, and it was just something that I needed to, if I didn't jump, then other people wouldn't be brave enough to do that either. Uh, the internet's where you get everything anyway these days, so it's very exciting to me that you don't have to have a DSTV subscription, you don't have to necessarily listen to radio. To find the songs you like, you just go online, download the songs you like, listen to them a hundred times and delete them. If you like a TV series, I don't know how many people here actually check what time it's on DSTV. Most of us, you don't have to put your hands up, are illegally downloading series and binge watching. <laughs> and the same would go for audio. Great audio content, great podcasts, the kind of content you really care about seemed to me to be an obvious thing. Nonetheless, everybody two and a half years ago, or two years ago when we first announced that we were going to do this, everybody with the exception of 
uh, at least in this room, John, and a few others, uh, a very few others, I might add, all thought I was mad. They all thought it was craziness, it was not going to work. Oh, we'll give this thing six months. He's going to go belly up, it's going to be a disaster, and then we'll never hear from him again. And some people were quite relieved about that. <laughs> some people may still be if it ever happens. But I think that's the exciting thing about risk, is that you, in, in the Rudyard Kipling poem, risk it all on one pitch of turn and, uh, what is it, one, one pitch of something and pitch and toss. Risk it all on, one, all on one turn and pitch and toss. Then lose and start again at your beginnings and never breathe a word about your loss. That's how it goes. And that rhymes, Ross, with your name and your beard. <laughs> but, but the point is that you won't have a reward if you don't take the risk. There's, there's, there's nothing that happens for nothing and you have to be prepared to take the chance that this could be a complete disaster and you could be left with bugger all and in this case, you know, brand and reputation that you've kind of built up over 20 years, all gone. Um, or you end up with something that you can include other people in, that's bigger than you, that's not about the number of hours you can invoice 5FM for, or the number of things you can do that you charge by the hour for the rest of the day. This is about suddenly uh, a 12 hour a day, five day a week content production hub where you have incredible people. I heard a Muzi uh, photo club here, Andrew Levy has a show on our platform. Um, every day I'm encountering people who are listening to shows that aren't mine, that have nothing to do with me, and they're surprised uh, to hear that the content's in any way linked to me, that it's our business. Shows about sex, and shows about animals, and shows about animals and sex. <laughs> See, because we're unregulated, we can do that. <laughs> but it, it, it's kind of the most exciting place to be. And because it's a small business and there are no expectations, we had to set the milestones. And I can confidently say that we passed everyone at the right time in the right way. And for an impatient guy like me, that means you have to go in for the long haul. You know, it's not something that you could expect instantaneous results from. But the number of people in this country who are just craving awesome content is bewildering and I had no idea that there would be this many people who would be 100,000 podcast downloads a week, which is spectacular to me in a place where there was nothing before. And it's a hybrid because we broadcast and podcast and essentially the podcasts are just the final product of what goes on air live as a broadcast in our little laboratory, which is a studio. And sometimes the product's phenomenal and sometimes it's okay, it could do with a little bit of tweaking here and there. But the good thing about this is it's totally authentic. So there isn't necessarily any amount of second guessing and editing and editorial control. And I mean, there's never been a show uh, where, where I've had to step in and say, you can't do that or you shouldn't do that. In fact, half the time, I'm surprised by what they do. And I kind of like that. And I think the audience like that too. Listeners all over the world, it's really just the most incredible thing. Had I known all of this at the beginning, I would have made that move with a lot less anxiety, insecurity, and I won't lie to you and pretend that I was confident the whole time. Uh, sometimes I was really <coughs> pretending very hard. Because there are those sleepless nights where you're lying in bed, and I lie in bed on my own. Yeah, I laugh, it's fine. <laughs> and you wake up at two in the morning and you're sweating and you're nervous and your mind hasn't really gone into subconscious or sleep mode and you've been thinking the whole time about the bottom line and the people you have to pay and the things you have to get done and remember for, for an idiot radio dj this is quite a big step suddenly you're running a business suddenly you're worrying about the bottom line suddenly you're thinking about clients um, it was never that complicated for me before. I'd just go on, do a three-hour show, and get out. Plus, that three-hour show was filled with music, so maybe I was doing 10 to 15 minutes of actual content on the hour. It wasn't really work. <laughs> now, it's three hours of solid content on the hour. I'm not being paid, which is very frustrating. I have to tell you, this not being paid thing is not what it's all <laughs> <for. laughs> This idea of, you know, the delayed gratification, I'm fucking over it. <laughs> But the, the fact that you can connect 
and this is what's so beautiful about being around 2016, is that you can connect to people all over the world. And you can connect to people with ideas that would never make it into mainstream media. And you can have discussions that could go on for 10 minutes, 20 minutes, an hour, two hours, uninterrupted. And if it's good enough, and it's smart enough, and it's inspiring enough, and it's entertaining enough, it doesn't make any difference because everybody's hooked in for the entire hour, two hours, whatever it might be. And of course, because you can download this stuff to your phone, which is the only device that you carry anywhere you go, it's the most convenient way for you to find the stuff that you care about and to listen to the whole thing. Not just like radio where you get out of the car because you've now arrived at your destination. And too bad if the DJ's been really entertaining because you're already five minutes late for your podcast. <laughs> this stuff lives with you. It goes to gym with you, it goes to work with you, it takes you home and back to work the next day. I think that's the kind of connection that I haven't really experienced. And remember, radio is really a one-on-one -on -one thing. But this is extraordinary because it's, um, it, you, you belong to people. Radio is still a thing that you find in cars. By the way, they're not manufacturing cars with FM radios in them in America anymore. So I don't know what they're planning to do with all these licenses that the car keeps issuing. Because <laughs> ultimately, that's just going to be a very expensive signal and a, a large infrastructure and, and bugger all else. Certainly not the content of the talent, because I'll have them. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they'll work for me for free, because uh, if you think freedom, and I don't mean for free forever, we've got a very sustainable model. I won't go into that. That's not what we had to talk about this morning. But um, freedom is very closely linked to risk. Uh, if you don't have freedom and you're constantly at risk, there's absolutely no reason to do it. If you have freedom and you take a risk, and you can exercise that freedom, it's always worth it. Whether it's in a creative sense, whether it's in a business sense, whether it's in a political sense, whether it's in a free speech sense, which is also one of the major reasons that I feel that we're moving into an era now where the genie's out of the bottle and they can't squeeze it back in. It's very, very cool to be around in 2016. Good luck to the government when they tried to jam signals in Parliament in January, and we all gave them a the big middle finger, and they had to switch it back on. And ever since then, any crack that appears, we climb in and it just expands, and we expose all their stupidity and craziness. And it doesn't just go for government, this goes for every other part of the world where there's in justice where it doesn't seem like things are connected to reality we can interrogate this stuff in a way that we haven't been able to before and everyone in this room can thanks to social media just please do it responsibly because there's another risk associated with that which is worth bringing everyone's attention to um, at the beginning of this year and just recently this week we've seen a lot of stupid things said by stupid people on social media and when you get involved, which is why you'll notice I'm very quiet on Twitter these days. <laughs> not because I'm frightened or because I feel that my speech is being curtailed or anything like that. It's just not worth it. I, I really don't give a shit to have to entertain people with bad intentions. That goes for racists. It goes for people who are politically correct, people who are looking for something nasty in you before they look for who you are and for what you do and what you mean. And when you talk about something like freedom of speech, you don't expect to be taken down by the lunatic left. But that's exactly what happened. And there was a knee-jerk reaction from Mnet which precipitated in them firing me from idols. Secretly, I was really <laughs> back on that show, which I'm not happy about. <laughs> that was not the reason I went to court. I went to court on principle. And and it was important because this is, I think, in this country, the first example of someone who said, no, 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 this mob are not representative of what the entire country think and say. There are only about three, th three million people, four million people at a maximum on Twitter in South Africa. That's a tiny scintilla of the population. And yet we allow them to dictate the national discourse. We think that if something's trending, it must be the most important thing in South Africa. It really isn't. And I promise you, those people in Buwani are not all on Twitter right now. And their problems are very real. 63,000 children who are going to be impacted by those 23 schools that have been burnt down. It's outrageous. And the Twitterati are worrying about some asshole in Cape Town who used the K word, who we should ignore because he's a dick. 
And we shouldn't ignore him because we allow and tolerate racism, but we shouldn't give him the front page of every newspaper. We shouldn't give him the importance that he clearly doesn't deserve. He doesn't represent even, is there anyone in this room who agrees with him? Let's see. So he represents 0% of what's going on in this room. And I have yet to meet someone who stands up for someone like Penny Sparrow. And even if you secretly harbor these things, which I would encourage you not to, in the mildest sense, there are much more vocal and vociferous ways I can tell you not to stand up for nonsense. But if you secretly harbor these things, they're not real beliefs, because I don't think you can secretly harbor beliefs. I think they eventually, they, they eke out and ooze out into your public persona, and you become the sort of person that no one wants to be around. But certainly, if, if you've been pretending for a couple of years, and I've been in broadcasting for 20 years, if in 20 years and over 17,000 hours on air, you still find a reason to misrepresent me, then you have all your work ahead of you, because I have 16,000 999 hours of audio for you to go through in order to prove a very faulty, very wobbly point of view, which you're probably not going to do very well to bring to any kind of fruition. But risk comes into everybody's life every day now, thanks to social media, and the reward comes in equally. You know, there are tremendously good things that can be done on social media, and there are tremendously dangerous things that can be done socially, but we must keep all these things in perspective. Just like we must keep in perspective that this is not the worst country in the world, and that we're not up in flames, and that not everything is a disaster. And we very quickly forget, we celebrated Freedom Day just the other day, 22 years, we forget about how hard that path was, and how difficult, and how much risk was involved in that transition for us. Because people don't study history, first and foremost, and even if they don't study it, You'd expect them to maybe read a little bit about it, but they don't even like doing that. So history means what happened last week. Yeah. And judged in that tiny paradigm, that tiny time space that you most immediately recollect, we don't have any appreciation for that long lens of history and the things that have happened before us that have enabled us to have conversations like this, which would have been an illegal gathering of a kind <laughs> at a certain time in this country's history. I think it should still be. You people don't look like the sort of people I'd leave alone in a room. <laughs> I had a guy come up to me once, and this is the, this is the beauty of what I do, and I, I have perhaps told the story before, but it means an enormous amount to me. It was a real moment of clarity. This stupid TV show that I'm on, um, we were all lined up <laughs> signing, signing autographs for people. Uh, which is a ridiculous concept in itself because I don't believe in South Africa we have any celebrities except Desmond Tutu. But if you believe there are, and some people do, we were sitting at a long table and signing autographs with all these contestants and the presenter of the show and the judges and me. And I was right at the end of the queue and these people would come along and they'd get everyone to sign. And the one guy came down the line and he got everyone to sign except me. And you just went, hey, Gareth, and walked away. <laughs> so, you know, your ego, you immediately think, ah, oh, what's going on? And I call him back and said, listen, dude, what, what the fuck, man? I mean, you got everyone else's autographs. You didn't get mine. What are you doing to me? So he said, he looked me right in the eye. I mean, this is, this is tough stuff because... You come at things with your own point of view, and then someone very quickly puts you in your place. He said to me, I listen to you every morning on the radio. I have heard what you think about things. I've heard you tell stories that made me laugh and stories that made me cry. I know you. You're my friend. Why would I want your autograph? Ah. Oh. It did, it did, and it does often bring a tear to my eye when you hear something like that, because that's the real connection that we're actually looking for. And some things social media can't replace. And some things are about that human connection. And if you risk anything, and you think that you'll have the human connection on the other side of it, it's probably worth it. Particularly in a creative industry, in a, uh, an advertising business, in a broadcasting or media operation. These are the things that we need to keep in mind. If we can't create those connections and we can't make them matter in a positive sense, we're wasting our time. It's the only lesson that's ever meant anything to me. And I end on that note because I'm probably out of time anyway on the talk. 
there'll be questions. Yes. Much more interesting when I'm asked questions because then you have time to think, I have time to think, and we can be funny. <laughs> Who wants to go first? Yes. I think everyone feel like I think everyone's currently for a while feeling a little up in the air. But what I spent a lot of time actually last night thinking about, which is something you mentioned just now, is how we constantly as a planet seem to give the platform to noisy idiots. What it, how do we how do we stop that? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, like, it's exactly that. We listen to one idiot's opinion and we all start talking about it while while millions of people go silently. And the more I observe it, the quieter the more critical thinking a person is, the less they are actually to speak out. So even less chance for them to be on a platform. Uh, that's your own fault. Yes, but how do we so change it? It's very easy because we don't have just three channels on TV anymore. We don't just have uh, five uh, radio stations that we can listen to. And we don't just have a couple of uh, uh, newsstands around the country that we can grab our newspapers from. You have the internet. And even things like Twitter are tremendously empowering in this respect. You don't have to block people, but you can mute them and they don't know you've blocked them. It's great. <laughs> I've muted hundreds of people and my life has infinitely improved. Is that what you did to me? That's what I did, Rob. Right? <laughs> well, I was going to cheek. I actually just started following you. Take that back. Um, if, if you think about it, We've become our own program directors. We've become our own sensor board. And I, I think, I say this with some trepidation because you, you do have, there is always the danger that you end up in a world of confirmation bias where you only are hearing the things that already support the positions you believe in, which is very dangerous. I think you've got to follow a whole bunch of people on social media. You've got to open yourself up to, to local and to international sources of news. But you don't have to listen to noise. And if you notice that someone is just a big drum that makes the loudest noise, and they're not particularly helpful, insightful, thoughtful, interesting, funny, any of those things, it's your own fault if you keep following them. And if you buy into that nonsense, because it's very easy to shut those people down, you just mute them. I mean, who could, can you imagine if you could do that in real life? <laughs> Fantastic, wouldn't it? You do that online and nobody will even know. They don't even have to be offended because they don't know that you're not listening. They're talking to the void. They have no idea. They might have 100,000 followers. 99,000 of those people could be muting them. I know I do. There are lots and lots of people that I, I don't follow, but I also don't have to hear from. And we tend to disproportionately give a lot of loud and troublesome people who have just discovered their voice on social media. They probably live in their parents' basement, and you know, they're sitting on a pay-as-you-go, and they think that they're a big political analyst and commentator, and everybody's taking them seriously because they got one re retweet from, I don't know, St. Letzi or Chester Missing or Gareth Tiffin. They think they're a big deal now, and nobody knows them. They walk past them in the underwear department of Edgar's, and you wouldn't bat an eyelid. So let's keep rational in all of this. I mean, part of the reason that someone like Donald Trump is the Republican candidate for president is because of political correctness. Noise. So, and there's noise, but, it, but it's partly an, a reaction to this, this crazy idea that you are allowed to use certain words, you aren't allowed to use others. It's this idea that you go around calling that one a misogynist and that one a racist, and it's watering down the whole concept. And someone like Donald Trump comes in, and he is all those things, and people go, oh, someone who can speak their mind, this is very refreshing. So neither is good, because we've lost the middle ground. And I, I think that that's partly because we don't have editors of newspapers who you know, sit through things and take out not just gross grammatical errors, which drive a lot of us crazy, but also take out like completely bullshit ideas that shouldn't see the light of day. Someone asked me the other day, what is, what is a teacher? You know, how, how do you know a good teacher from a bad? A teacher is someone who tries to change your mind 
when your mind is based on things that are not real. In other words, they're trying to teach you about reality as opposed to nonsense. I think that's a good definition. Because all the other, the, the nonsense, the stuff that a lot of us make a living out of, to be frank, is your imagination. And don't get me wrong, radio, broadcasting, media, it's, a lot of it's to do with imagination. It's one of the reasons it's magical. But when it comes to teaching people and to dealing with each other rationally, we have to believe in things that are real. And there's so much hocus pocus going on that a lot of that time, a lot of the time, it doesn't make any sense. Yes. Of producing what? Noise. Noise. Um, you see, the nice thing about Tiff Central is we're not a broadcast medium, so we're not just free to air that people that's in the background that you can just tune into any time and it's going to get in your way or not entertain you or be something you're not interested in. You have to come to us to get this content. Anyone who's coming to us, de facto, they must be either curious or interested, and even if they only try it once and decide that they're not, they made that decision. The audience have the power. It's not like you just stumble upon me on the FM dial somewhere and, and go, oh, that was bullshit. <laughs> so no, uh, and, and that's why we have shows that are as diverse and divergent as we do. Uh, who are some of the people that have influenced you, and, like inspired you into getting into this new platform and like your, you know, your teachers at university? Um, you know, I, I, I take inspiration. It's, it's very difficult for me to say that there are role models and and necessary heroes, uh, because I, I'm nervous about that too. I think humans just always let you down. Um, but there are people who I, I do draw some inspiration from. A lot of them are a 20-year-old amateur who we give a show to, and, and they, there's one girl who started a new podcast with us two weeks ago. Her name is Mbali, and she's doing a show called The Maid Report. Uh, she goes around and interviews domestic workers. So she interviews them on her phone. She puts together these programs. She asks like five to 10 domestic workers the same question. So it'll be like, what did you find in the madam's underwear drawer? <laughs> um, how do you negotiate for a fair wage? Um, are you expected to wear one of those slave uniforms? You know, all this stuff. I mean, this is a whole world of undiscovered treasure, if you ask me. She puts it together. And now she's connecting domestic workers all over South Africa with this podcast. So, and don't think that just because so, someone's a domestic worker, they don't have a smartphone and they don't know how to use how to hack into the madam's Wi-Fi <laughs> and download, download stuff because they are. <laughs> and if you think about it, there's never been a union for domestic workers. There's never been a place where they could share their stories. There's never been a place where they could commune. And this is revolutionary. There's a huge number of women all over this country who will now be able to share content that is niched, that is organized and thought for particular to them. It's an, it's an incredible idea. I think this sort of thing is what will revolutionize media, what, what will re revolutionize the way that we advertise to certain target markets because it's no longer about research and it's no longer about demographics. It's now something about psychographics and about niches. And if you're selling something like, let's say you are selling insurance policies to domestic workers, or even their madams, because their madams are going to want to listen in on this stuff, trust me. <coughs> this is going to be the place to do it. And if you're only interested in fly fishing, we'll have a fly fishing podcast one day, and 50 people listen to that. Those are the most valuable 50 people for someone who sells fly fishing equipment in the entire spectrum of media. I think that's valuable. That's really cool. So that's where we're revolutionizing. Thank you for that question, by the way. Yes? When are you finally going to go into politics? <laughs> Me? Yeah. I, uh, politics is a nasty, ugly, horrible game, and there's no way. There are lots of people uh, who I know. I, I wouldn't go so far as to call them friends, but I have people who I know quite well in, in politics, and it's just not the kind of thing. Would anyone in this room want to be in politics? Look at what an ugly game it is. No, I mean, that's why no, I won't. <laughs> I'm not your Judas coach. I want to be happy and I want to be honest. Those two things are impossible in politics. You have a bigger faith than that. Somebody wow. Talk about pressure. No, <laughs> Listen to these podcasts. It's enough, all right? I'm breaking my back three hours in the morning. Come on. 
What do you want from me? No, I, you know what? I think everyone in this room has to be a politician in this, in this up, upcoming election. This is massively important. Um, I, I so, I, I'm, I'm heartened and, and thrilled and enthusiastic about the fact that more young people registered during those two weeks in March uh, than in any other election we've had in this country. People under the age of 25. These are people who really, you know, say what you will about millennials. Um, this, this is perhaps the moment where political awareness and your own personal needs intersect. It's exciting to see what's going on here. I hope we all, I don't care who you vote for, I don't care what your, I don't even care if you don't vote, but you register to vote and you have a say nonetheless. Or if you're one of those anarchists who doesn't believe in it, keep saying why you don't. But don't stay out of the conversation. And in particular, don't stay out of it just because you believe the EFF won't win, or because you believe that your voice has just won. The, the, the great thing about democracy, as it was founded by, you know, the old ancient Greek, I'm talking about Aristotelian um, democracy and, and the kind of democracy they had before Pericles. Um, this was everyone from the town, everyone in Athens would actually go, and that was parliament. Obviously, we can't do that, there's not a building big enough for all of us, so we have to have the Republic a representative for each of us, but being involved is everyone's responsibility, not just mine. If I can make a difference in there, I can have a voice and give you a voice, excellent. But I don't want to go into politics. Thank you. <laughs> yes, sir. Um, Gareth, uh, number one, I'll compliment you on Gareth Cliff and all that. Oh. When did you notice? <laughs> 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 I'll, I'll pass it on to my parents if you don't <laughs> They fucked very hard to make me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Julius. Mm. Uh, my Please choose carefully who comes in. <laughs> so far I'm in good company, yes. When did you notice that rudeness is the greatest profitable business? Rudeness? Yes. Because all of you guys are rude and people do. My man is rude. Yes. <laughs> He's got the arrogancy, he hides under so? the pillar of education. He's a bit of a pussy a lot of the time. So you, the three of you, when did you notice? Because my mother, somewhere he was quiet, he realized, as he was trying to lift his head, nobody noticed yeah. And he said, oh, Gareth and Julius mm. can speak up and now he's been listening. I, I hope it's not rudeness. I hope it's, it's um, open-mindedness and free speech. Uh, that, uh, that I prefer. You're going to offend. Sorry, what's your name? I'm Gafiso. Gafiso, you're going to offend someone sometime. Trust me, it's going to happen. Everyone, the most polite people, little old ladies who, who go through books and, and cross out the bad words with black pokey pen. Even they, at some point, are going to be rude to somebody. It's going to happen. And it's what you do with that that matters. You know, I've often said when it comes to this offense thing, offense is something that's taken, it's never given. You decide to take offense, so that responsibility is all yours. You could call me anything you want, and I have been called a lot of really horrible things. It's what I do with that that's important. I do not go out with the intention of being rude to people. I'm, I, I sometimes speak my mind, and I've very often spoken it in an ill-advised and not necessarily smart way, and it does get me into trouble. But I take every one of those occasions again I wouldn't change a single thing, because in each of them there's a lesson for me, but more importantly, there is the, the freedom you create for someone else. If you say that Julius and I have created the freedom for Musi, that's a very high expectation. <laughs> uh, I happen to think, by the way, that Musi took a, a step in the wrong direction where he started saying, Butzak Zuma, I think that that's unnecessary for him. I think he's actually a much more well-mannered guy than that, and I, I kind of like that about him. But in, in the case of Julius and Floyd and Mbuyiseni and those guys, these are people who have found their voice. They speak for many others. Um, as much as I may disagree or agree with them, and I find myself doing half and half, it keeps things interesting. And like Justice Malala said yesterday on my show, if we didn't have the EFF ca causing this no noise and nonsense in Parliament every time, saying, you know what, actually, we don't know whether you're legitimate or not then things would just carry on as usual, and we'd just go, ah, it's fine. The president's just been told by the Constitutional Court 
that he no longer can uphold the Constitution effectively. And that's no small deal. And thank goodness people like Julius and Buisen and Floyd and, and you know, Godrich and the rest of them are doing what they're doing. Because even though it's not good manners, sometimes that's the way that you create a change. Again, it's risk. That risk gets them thrown out of Parliament very often. The reward is that they're going to get a lot of votes as a result. I think they'll get a lot of support. Many people are still nervous about them. Who knows how this will turn out? But I do think out of all the new parties that have come along since 1994, uh, this one's got the greatest chance of growing rather than receding. So I hope that answers your question. I promise I'm not trying to be rude every time. I think we can do one more. Yes, okay, one more. Hi. You're lucky. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Um, I just wanted to ask you, uh, do you have any pointers on stupid risk versus good risk when it comes to doing something new? I mean, what made you decide that this is this is going to be a great risk to take as opposed to like, no, this is going to be shit? Um, you know, I've got someone who works with me called Rena Bromberg. Rena's the good risk. I'm the stupid risk. <laughs> <laughs> Rena knows everything on earth. She's like an oracle. Many of you at TBWA will know her. She's worked with me for 19 years now. And though we fight and argue and disagree on many things, I will always defer to her wisdom and experience. And the thing that she does that no one else does really is she can feel the situation. She, there's an intuition there that's better than what intellect or entertainment I can add to something. And I think you've got, to, you've got to have good people around you and you've got to have people who understand different covariant effects and different resource problems and different people problems before you enter into a risky situation. You really have to ask people who have either done it before or who know things you don't in order to minimize the amount of actual risk that you'll have. The fact that we've been profitable since day one at cliffcentral.com is extraordinary. Um, two years, we celebrated on the 1st of May. I'm off to, I went to South by Southwest uh, a month and a half ago, which was incredible. It's, this, it's brain food, really. It's the most interesting, interactive, digital convention in the world. And J.J. Abrams got up there and spoke after he's just directed Star Wars. Obama spoke there. The President of the United States has never spoken of one of these things before. It was usually just for geeks. And he was there because he knew if he wants to be relevant, he needs to be at South by Southwest. The world is ours. It's young people. It's people who are thinking in digital ways, in new communication terms, in, 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 in instant gratification. All these areas are areas that we operate in. I should think there isn't a person in this room who doesn't realize that's important. At the end of this month, I've been invited along to go to Google for a day, and I'm spending a day at Facebook. Um, and these guys are on the cutting edge of everything, from delivery by drone, to how you can sell advertising in ways that it's never been sold before. And even the sort of technology that will bind biology and machine. Um, there was a guy who spoke at South by Southwest who said that they're, they're busy working on ways to improve memory by using technology and interfacing nerve cells and microchips. This is the absolutely most exciting thing about being alive right now. It means we can conquer Alzheimer's and Parkinson's in the short term, now in our lives, but also that we could instantly with the blink of an eye, and you wouldn't even have to blink your eye because it would be in your head already, you'd be able to speak French, and you'd be able to understand complex things like uh, relativity. Uh, you'd download all the information you needed before you went into a meeting. You'd never need notes again. These kinds of things are not far away. I, 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 it's exciting, and it sounds like science fiction. A guy called Ray Kurzweil is writing about how Nanobots are going to go racing through our bloodstream at half the size of an erythrocyte, a red blood cell, repairing at a molecular level each of our cells so we will never age and we will never die. Get that into your head. 
Obviously, this is upsetting to God because it counts him out of the equation. But this is the future that we can all take advantage of. And this stuff is possible, the singularity, if you, uh, if you read Ray Kurzweil, he said by 2025, which is really not far away, we will be able to have microprocessors that can effectively do more than the human brain in half the time. So this world of having a career or having a house or having limited resources, soon all of that will be a thing of the past. It's a very exciting future we're marching into. Don't worry about risk, there's lots of reward. Just make sure that you, uh, you surround yourself with smart people and when you make those risk decisions that you don't start getting carried away with yourself when it does work and when it doesn't work that you don't give up and think that that's the end of your, 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 your opportunity, your possibility. It's just the beginning. Thank you very much. <laughs>